So uh, hello everyone and welcome to our ICAM Foundation webinar. On today's uh, webinar, we will talk about the FLOOK and the file IOS functions. My name is Alex Gordon and I'm joined by my colleague Daniel uh, to help me on the presentation. So have a, uh, as I've just said, we will look at the look ahead, uh, the FLOOK look ahead function and then all the functions related to the file IO, which we will explain a little bit later. The FLOOK function is a look ahead type function, and it has a system variable called $look with a n number between brackets that we will uh, talk a little bit later, which is the same variable as the $FLOOK, which is a syntax, which use two types of arguments, the n uh, variable, which is mandatory, and additional arguments that are optionals. The n argument is also called a context number for this function, is a variable type real with uh, that must be an integer, and the only possible values for that, uh, var uh, that variable is 0 to 5. When you use 0, the $f look will check if there's any f look that is currently active and return you the number one to five if one of those uh, f look is active or zero if none of the f look are active at all. When you use one to five, this will start a look ahead. Uh, basically, the context number is the internal ID of the f look. You can have five f look active at uh, at the same time, and if you uh, if you terminate an F look and recall it later on, it will be uh, it will be a different F look. Uh, you can also have multiple F look uh, nested inside of each other. That means that you could be inside of the uh, of F look one and start F look two uh, while still being a look at. However, uh, this is not fully recommended because this will make the uh, uh, the process, the post-processing, much longer if you have multiple F look nested inside of each other. If you are inside of a look ahead, let's say F look one, and you call again F look one, it will terminate the F look rewind to uh, the beginning of the F look and continue with the normal po uh, post-processing. The additional arguments are basically variables that are non-read only so they must be writable and they can have any possible values from sequence uh, major minor words uh, logical states uh, and, uh, numbers etc uh, once when you terminate an f look those variables will, uh, the value will be retained and returned to you so you can use them to uh, change the behavior of your post or uh, use that variable inside of a string or inside of a system variable of uh, the post processor. That means you can use a system variable in your additional argument and once you terminate the F look, that system variable will be overwritten by the final value you had inside of the F look. If you want to use an array, you must specify the beginning and the end of the array that you want to save. It can be the full array as it could be a small part of the array. Uh, you need to call the array by its name and between brackets, the starting position, comma, through, comma, the name of the array with the, the end position you want to save. There's no limits on how many additional arguments inside of the F look that you, uh, that you can have. However, the more you have, the more taxing it will be on the system when returning all the variables. To terminate an F look, there's three ways of, uh, of doing so. You can, as I've said before, call $F look with the same context number. You can set the system variable of the same context number $look to any number. Or if you reach the last line, the fini line on a CL file, this will uh, terminate the F look. 
when you terminate the F look, the dollar F look will return uh, a value, and that value will change depending on how you uh, close that, uh, you terminated that F look. So if you terminate it by recalling dollar F look with the same context number, it will return minus one. If it is through a setting the dollar look to a specific number, it will return that specific number. And if you reach the Fini line, it will return minus two. You can also put dollar look on the right hand side of an equal sign. And if you do so, it will return either a one or a zero stating that you uh, the current F look, well, not the current F look, the F look of that uh, context number is either one active or zero inactive. Here's a quick example. If we look on the, on the left, we are assigning dollar F look of context number two, so uh, F look ID two to the variable percent L01. Then afterwards, we're just checking the state of what uh, the F look to uh, is at the current moment. And then we terminate the, uh, we terminate the F look. So there's three states, that uh, three moments that we wanna look. We wanna before the F look. Obviously those are local variables that we don't have to uh, initialize. However, if you don't use them, they are not initialized. So you, you will not see any value in them. Then when you trigger the F look, percent L01 becomes equal to zero because this is the state of the dollar F look when you start to look ahead. And percent L02 would return one uh, when you reach that line because the look ahead number two is currently active. Then we would reach the dollar look two equal 13. This will terminate the look ahead and we would return in normal processing to percent L01. However, we already processed that line, so we won't process it a second time. After the F look, so after the fact, percent L01 is now equal to 13 because we terminated the look ahead using dollar look equal a number, and that number is 13. And percent L02 is now equal to zero because the look ahead is now currently act inactive. So we've seen how to uh, how to use the dollar f look function, and now let's put it in, practi in practical use. So the f look is mostly used to get specific information that you would uh, normally have as you go on the post pro uh, on the post processing or at the end of the program. And you wanna use that information to either take some decision during the post-processing or the, uh, the operator, the machine operator would have to take some decision also uh, depending on what we have. Here for this example, we'll want to know the number of block on the program, the total cycle time of the program, and the total time per tool. The number of block can be interesting if you have a really old machine that has a very limited amount of space on it and you know how many blocks it would accept to have a full program. So this is just a sanity check for you guys uh, to see if the program will be okay or if you need to break it in multiple segments. The total machine time obviously is an estimation of how much time it would take to machine, uh, machine a part. And the total time per tool can be useful for uh, the life expectancy of tools. So if you have a database that tracks the amount of time you've been using certain tool and you know that your tool can only last uh, about 2000 hours, for example, well, you, you wanna know when you're ever gonna reach that 2000 hours. So having a summary of how much time you've used a tool can be really useful. However, that information only comes available as we go. Uh, but would be a good idea to have it at the beginning of a program where you have the editor. Most of the time you'll have a tool table. So if you have the time, the operator can always already take the decision, of, oh, I need to prepare a second tool for tool number one, or uh, I'll change it right away, whatever is your way of working. So from there, I'm gonna leave it to my colleague Daniel to show you how we would implement those three information at the beginning of the post.
All right, uh, thank you, Alex. Um, so here, we'll start with the, um, we'll start from Jenner. We'll be, like Alex said, we'll be writing a couple of uh, macros here to um, get the information at the beginning of processing or um, in the header. Um, so let's create a new post here. Uh, we'll just give it a name. Select a machine, and in our in our case, it doesn't really matter um, what we choose, since we're only working with the uh, with the header. Here, I'm just going to generate, and we'll be focusing here on the uh, post processor customization section, um, the startup and shutdown procedure, and we will mo uh, mostly be working with the machine startup and the machine shutdown macros. Um, so let's start with the um, sequence number here. So. Uh, we're interested in looking at the um, last sequence number uh, that's being output um, and we'll do that using an F look. Uh, so here let's start with a quick with our macro. So like I said we want to fire a look ahead so let's put it inside of a variable here and then we'll fire F look one and then we want to output to our tape file um, a comment by using pprint. Uh, the last sequence number is, and then we'll give it a format. Um, I'll also give it, uh, put this inside of a um, variable here, and let's call this last signal. Uh, so we'll fire a look ahead here. And then after the look ahead, we'll come back here and then simply output the last sequence number as a uh, as a comment. Let's make sure we declare our variables here. So we'll declare a real, initialize it at zero. And we gotta make sure we save this value inside of machine shutdown. Since we're interested in the value at the, at the, at the end here. So, and we can use the system variable signal, which stores the sequence number. Um, and then we also wanna make sure we uh, terminate our Look at um, in this situation, uh, since we're going through the whole tape, uh, we're gonna hit the fini line. It's gonna come back um, through the fini, but you know, as a best practice, you, you wanna, if you wanna terminate this look ahead somewhere else, then you can use this method. And I just gave it a random number um, to terminate the look ahead. So let's see what it gives us. So I'm gonna start a runtime. And I have a, the sample file that you all have in the sample folder that comes with the installation. And now we're going to put ourselves right after the F look here, the two break points I have. And let's go through. So now you will see I'm stopped right before the line is being output to the tape file. And if I click once, you guys will see that the value is zero. And that's because during my look ahead that was triggered here, I forgot to store my value. So let's go back and store the value inside of the look ahead. So we make sure that after the look ahead comes back, um, we keep the whatever value it was. So now if you run again, and we go through our look ahead and now we output the line. Now we know that the sequence number is 400. If we run the whole tape, let's fast forward this, uh, we'll see that we're right about 409. Um, we take account the percent here. Uh, we can subtract one if we really want to make sure that the last one is um, the, before the, the end sign there. Uh, so that's how you would store a sequence number. Fairly simple. Let's do the same thing now with the machining time. And um, so we want to go, we want to print um, the total machining time is, and then let's give it a format and give it a name. Make sure we, now let's make sure we put it inside of our um, F look and declare the value. And in our machine shutdown, 
um, we want to store the value of the total machining time. And what we're going to put inside here are three system variables that are automatically calculating and storing the values of machining time. And these are feed time, which uh, is the uh, feed rate time in seconds. And we're gonna add to that wrap time, which is the rapid time. And then miss time, which are all the miscellaneous time, such as um, any delays. So with that, we'll have the total feed rate, rapid and miscellaneous times added in seconds. So let's go back to the tape. We'll hit play again. Step through. And then we'll see that we have our time in seconds. Um, let's format this to have it uh, output in minutes, hours, and seconds instead. Um, to do that, you can either mathematically compute it yourself, or you can use the special formatting, which takes um, three numbers separated by colons. And then we'll have two here. So we'll have two digits for the seconds two digits for the minutes, and we'll have two digits for the hours. Um, I'm going to add an E at the front for excess, so I want a zero at the front. And now if we go back, hit play again, and you'll see now we have a machining time that is formatted. Uh, so that's a nice way of uh, seeing how much, what's the total machining time, and sending that all the way back up in, of the tape file using an flook, uh, which will process the whole tape. Um, now for the tool list, I could show you guys uh, a nice way to store the tool list at the end of processing, put it inside variables, and then keep the variable at the top. Again, similar to what we did with the total machining time and the sequence number. Um, but for some uh, but for some of you who have very, very large tape files, you might have a lot of tool changes. Um, so that's a lot of information to store. Instead, what I'm going to do um, is we're going to um, put that inside of a file, save that file, and then we're going to read that file outside of it, look, look ahead. So I'm going to give back, um, get back to Alex here, who, who will show you how we'll use a file I.O to generate a file, uh, the tooling list and then read that tooling list outside of look ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again. So we're gonna take now a look at the file items. So there's four functions available to you to open, read, write uh, to external or in internal file uh, of the post processor. So obviously you have the open command that lets you open that file to reserve it on your system. So that way uh, you are able to write to it. Then you have the close command that lets you, that release the file. You have the write to write on that file or to read to read one line of the file. For the open command, you have, well, for each of the commands, you have what we call the unit numbers. This is a internal ID of that file that lets you uh, recall that file without having to re-specify its name each and every time. So the only time you would call the name of that file would be when you open it. So for the open com command, you have the unit number followed by an optional argument, either front or rear. By default, the open command will use the front optional argument. Uh, when you open by the front, it will overwrite everything. It will erase everything in the file if it already exists. Uh, and then you will write to that file. If you open it using the rear argument, it will open it at the end of the file and whatever you write to that file will be appended at the end. Then you have the file name, which is the, you need to have the full path of where that file is. For example, here we have open slash 22, comma front, which I could add, just not specified on that one, comma, and then I want to open my 
file, which is located in program data, my folder, and the cook file is called myfile.txt, and it needs to be in string format between single quotes. The, uh, the close command that will release the file is just close slash 22 for the uh, 22 ID that we have specified before. If you want to write to that uh, file, you would use write then the unit number 22 and then a format string. So here, classic example, hello world. If you realize here we have two exclamation mark, it's because the exclamation mark is the beginning of a string format in our uh, language. So if you want to really output the exclamation mark, you need, uh, you need uh, it twice. And this is valid for every special character that uh, will do some string formatting inside of the string. Those characters, you can see a list of them inside of the campus user guide that is provided with the installation. Then you have the read command that will read one line. And then if you read it, uh, that file again, it will read the next line, so on and so forth until you reach the end of the file if you have multiple read or if it is inside of well. So again, the unit number, a format string, same thing as for the write command. However, you need to assign it to a variable. So that way, that variable will become the string that you have read. Uh, that you have read. The format string on this case needs to be dimensioned to read a specific amount of characters. For example, here we are reading the file 22, so my file.txt. I want the 90 characters, the 91st characters of the line, and I want to put them in my text bar. There's some notes to take here. Uh, to take here. If you want to use the internal file system of the post processor, instead of using the full path, you could use forward, forward slash, icamfs, forward slash, and then uh, the file name that you want to put it. The unit numbers must be between 20 and 29. Then the unit numbers that are outside of that range are system files that are used inside of our software. So it is really not recommended to use those files because you could override something that is not uh, meant to be override and the, uh, the software wouldn't be aid the way it is to be, it needs to be. So from there, I'm gonna leave it to Daniel to complete the example that we've worked on a little bit earlier, but instead using the file IO to get the information we want. All right, thank you, Alex. Um, so let's get back to our example. So we'll start here. Um, so now, like we we're saying, we want to generate a file during the look ahead, and then we'll be reading that file outside of the look ahead. So let's start with the machine shutdown here, uh, where we'll be generating our file during a look ahead. And to do that, we'll put it inside of a conditional uh, if statement, and we'll say if f look of zero is equal to one. So only during the F look uh, context one will be stepping inside of this uh, of this loop. And then what we're going to do inside is we want to um, open our, our document. And for this, I can I have two ways, right? I can hard code a path if I know that this specific document is always going to be in one location. Or in this situation here, I'm going to create and read the file um, on the fly and it's created at the location of where my CL file is going to be. To do that here, I'll use a function called directory name or dear name, which will return uh, the path of the argument inside, which will be my CL file. And to that, I will concatenate um, the file name that I want to create, or which is uh, tooling.txt. First thing I'm going to write inside of that file is a quick header. Uh, so I'm going to use some tab formatting just to have everything nicely um, tabled. 
I'm going to call this a tool name, and then I'm going to add to this further along more tabs. And I'm going to add the machining time. So this will be the first line of the file. It'll just be a header. Now for the actual um, reading or writing of the tool name and the machining time, we'll be using a couple of things. First, we'll be putting it inside of a do loop. So let's get, let's start with that. And then second, we know we have to write to that file some information. And what we're going to write for the tool name is we'll be making use of $TL tab or tool tab. Uh, so to get more information on that, you can go through the document or you can use the online help using the F1 key on your keyboard. And you can see that TL tab here provides information about a lot of information about the tool. So these are the, col uh, these are the columns and then, uh, sorry, these are the rows and then each column represent a tool. And every tool that is processed in this, uh, that every tool that happens or every tool change that happens, if it's a new tool, a new column would appear. So in our case here, we'll be using TL tab row 20 uh, because this is a row of interest. We want the tool name, which, it, which is already formatted in string. So we'll be using TL tab of 20. And then we want to give it which column we want to use. So which tool number we're going to use is going to be iterative, right? We want to make sure we go through the first tool, the second tool, so on and so forth. To do that, we'll declare here a variable. Uh, which is just going to be a local real. We'll call it I. And I here will always start at two. And that's because the tool tab here, um, even though it starts at one, tool one will always be the dummy tool. So we want to make sure we start at two. And then we just iterate through all our tools. And the all our tools value is stored inside of TL size. So this will start at our first tool which is I equals to two, and it will go through all the tools that we'll be using, uh, which is stored inside of the TL size. And with that, we can create our tooling table, uh, or we can store all the values. For the machining time here, we have a very similar strategy. We could use, um, we could use TL, dollar TL sum. So if we hit F1 again to see what TL sum contains, Right here, the first three contains the value of the feed time, the positioning time, and all other times in seconds. So let's make use of that. So we'll be using TL sum one of i, and then we can add to this two and three. And we'll store this inside of a variable called tool time. And let's declare this variable. And the reason why I'm going to store inside this variable is because we're going to need to convert this to a string, right? Because we have to remember this is in seconds. So we need to convert this into a string, right? We can only write strings. Um, so to do that, we'll be using the function fs write, And then we'll format our time to be the same as I showed you previously. And that is how we're going to create our loop. And then we best practice is to close our unit here. So this is our loop during look ahead. We want to look during a look ahead. We want to open the file, write a header, loop through all our tools and write the tool name and the total machining time of each tool. In a machine startup here, we want to make sure that we only process this outside of a look at it. And to that, we can use dollar any look. And this will make sure any look is true whenever there's any kind of look ahead. 
and since we want to make sure that during no no kind of look ahead we want to step inside we could use this logic uh, to make sure that we never step inside of this uh, of what we're going to do inside of here um, so what we're going to do we're going to open the file again um, so if your name see a name same location as before And then we, we're going to read the file. And again, you, like Alex was saying, we need to put a format with uh, that is dimensioned, put it inside of some kind of variable. So I'm just going to call it one line. And I'm also going to declare this variable. Uh, you don't have to declare a variable, but it's a good practice to always declare your variables. And then after reading it, I'm just going to p print it or print it as a comment. Exactly what it is. And we got to make sure we close it at the end. Now, where we're, I left space here, it's because we're going to put this inside of a loop, right? We want to make sure we read everything that is inside of that file. To do that, I'll write a while loop. And then we'll do the, here's a function that we can use, which is E-F-E-O-F, -E which stands for end of file. So we're going to check if we're at the end of file 22. Now, I want to make sure that I'm not at the end of file, then keep looping. And then when it is at the end of file, I want to end, step out of the loop, and then close the file. And so that's essentially how we're going to read the file and I'll put the values to the tape. So you guys can see here, um, this is a locator of my app source or my CL file, and I don't have that tooling.txt. If I go back here, rewind, I have a breakpoint on my look ahead. If we step once to process it, you see that tooling txt got created and through this little window here and I can open it for you guys. You see that the exact information that I wanted uh, was generated. Now I can see that I made a mistake here, forgot one of my um, formatting for my T30 here. But we're just going to keep going ahead. And then you see that the, it was output as we expected, right? We have the header, our tool name, and then all the information that was inside. And then it processes as normal. And then the, we're at the end of the tape, All right? So let's go make our correction here. Let's make sure we have our exclamation mark. Let's roll back quickly, step through. And see now it's nicely formatted and we have our tool name on a machining time. So that's how you would, that's a nice technique to store some values and then use them later, um, for example. And here the example is for a tool list with the total machining time. And before we end this uh, webinar here, or before the end here, I'm just gonna give you guys a couple tips and tricks on how you can debug um, your posts um, during a look ahead. So first here you'll see, I'm stopping just before the look ahead and I'm going to hit F11 on my keyboard or F10 for the step and I want you guys to pay attention here to the bottom right. I'm just gonna make this a little smaller so you guys can see. On the bottom right, you guys will see an arrow that will go forwards and then come back. That's when you know a look ahead, regardless of what look ahead it is, is triggered. So it's going to go pretty fast. So you guys saw the arrow here. Let me roll back. Show sure you guys one more time. I'm gonna step inside, focus on the bottom uh, right here, this arrow that goes back and forth is what the look ahead is, right? So every time there's a look ahead that's fire, there's an arrow that goes forward and back, right? It goes all the way till until it stops and then comes back. So if you have multiple look aheads, you'll see that arrow fly of keep going forwards and backwards. Another neat trick here, yeah, let's go back just before look ahead. Um, and you guys probably saw me do it at the beginning 
is under Tools and Preferences, under the Debug tab. Under Debugging Options, the third checkbox here enables debugging during FLOOK type look at. What it means is, if you guys pay attention here to the bottom left, we're in regular processing. If I press F11 on my keyboard to step to the FLOOK, now my mode has changed to FLOOK1. So that means I'm now processing in look ahead. So if I keep stepping inside, you guys will see that the tape file isn't really changing, but I'm actually processing through the code as if as normally, but there's not going to be any form of output to the tape. Now, if we go back, and now that I'm back to regular processing, now the tape file is being generated. So that's a nice way of um, debugging look aheads. If you see a lot of back and forth arrows, uh, then you know that there's a lot of look aheads happening. Right. Um, so that'll be all for the examples. And I'm just gonna give back uh, control to Alex here. One more thing that uh, we will show you is uh, during the last phase of that uh, webinar, of that example, if we look at line number two, sequence uh, number two, we are at 410 in terms of last sequence number. However, if we move all the way back at the bottom, we are at 417. The reason why it's like that, it's the actual uh, part where we write to the editor, which is only happening when we're not in a uh, look ahead. So obviously, when the look ahead processed uh, all the lines, it was it stopped at 410 to afterwards go back to uh, the regular processing, enter that uh, that value, and then we wrote to the editor all the tooling information that we added. So this is where the, you have a discrepancy. So one way of putting that would be to add to the last sec no variable a not a buffer but a compensation depending on how much tool you would uh, you would have using the dollar tl size that you uh, that you have so thank you very much for attending this webinar uh, there's no question that was answered so we will end it here for today and as always, if you have any question, you can always send an email at support at ICAM.com and we will uh, reply to you shortly with the answer to your question. So again, thank you very much for attending and stay safe.